Hey guys, welcome back. This week, I'm gonna talk about the Flood. I mean, they're one of the most interesting and horrifying antagonists in the Halo universe. Many out there theorize what their release today on Earth will look like, but I feel like they're a bit short-sighted. They lack the real-world societal and political implications of a Flood outbreak, particularly informed by the context of the last few years. This week, join me as we explore how a Flood outbreak in the Pacific Northwest realistically might actually look like. To start, we need to understand the Flood. They first appeared in the Halo universe when they were encountered by ancient humanity. For the most part, they were inert, kind of like dust and derelict vehicles. It took centuries before they truly began to be known for the horrifying purpose. Humanity at the time used that dust when they realized that it helped their domesticated animals act more calm, as well as providing very beneficial traits. So they used that for hundreds of years to kind of help mold their pets. But eventually it started to cause issues. They acted violently, almost as if they had like rabies. It started to go by the name of the shaping sickness. Control measures were put in place, but it wasn't enough. And soon it spread to humans and from there planet to planet. Humanity would fight a losing war against the flood until they started to make some progress, sacrificing over a third of their race. But this led to the conflict with the foreigners who would ultimately control and dominate humanity and then themselves realize the flood was out there and then ultimately lose, resorting to activating the halo rings to end the threat through their own destruction. Following a similar theme, we'll start a hypothetical narrative in the rural Pacific Northwest and Eastern Washington. A meteorite has fallen to the surface, and although visually spectacular, it's a relatively common occurrence and doesn't attract much attention. Minus a couple posts on Facebook from locals about the brilliant green flash in the middle of the night, it won't draw much, you know, looks. A small rock core no larger than a football carries the insidious yet devastating flood spore. As it crashes into the soil, the moisture helps the spores start to duplicate and spread. And it is there that the first vector of its spread will begin. An inquisitive pet belonging to a local rancher, a shepherd, comes up and starts sniffing. And it is through that mechanism of use exploring with its nose and sniffing the rock, it accidentally inhales some of the loose spores that were regrowing on the surface. The first indication something might be wrong would be the slow and steady changes in behavior in the dog. Most of us know our pets well, but I feel like it still takes a couple days before you notice the lethargy, the mood changes. And possibly it is after these few days that the dog's owner, the rancher, notices that something is acting up. The dog is lame. It doesn't want to get up. It is running a high fever. So they decide to drive into town and take him to the vet, a natural response that any of us would do. But in the time since the dog first got exposed to the spores, it was interacting with their livestock. And unbeknownst to them, they would also be infected. When they get to the veterinarian, they struggle to identify the issue. None of them are wearing protective equipment because it's not necessary. I mean, they're just at the vet. They think maybe it's parvo or kennel cough, very common diseases in dogs. They have seasonal spikes similar to the flu. But as upon closer inspection, the vet notices gross under the skin. Some of the areas the fur is thinning and falling out, and there's other indications of more serious disease. She orders blood tests to be done, and it's clear there are cells in the blood being attacked by white blood cells, and it, they end up ruling it some form of a novel bacterial infection. Despite antibiotic treatment, it's ineffective, and it's at this point they make the humane decision to euthanize the dog and cremate its body. The vet, though, is alarmed, both by the novelty and the newness of this disease. She doesn't recognize it from her studies, Although primarily focusing on supporting the livestock in there, they still see plenty of pets. She decides to send an email to her boss, the practice owner of the veterinary clinic. He then spends a week analyzing the data, trying to understand it, and ultimately comes to the conclusion that he has not seen it before. He submits a cursory email to the local county wildlife, fish, and game department, as well as the health department, noting an odd but so far singular case. It's now been seven days. The rancher, he's developed a cough, the first sign of infection. The spores released in the dog's breathing and its saliva have found its ways into his lungs. This is where his body will desperately try to fight back through inflammation and white blood cells. His livestock have also begun to act abnormal. They walk odd, stumble, and fall, and some are showing much more obvious signs including tumors and lesions on their skin. And this time it's not hidden behind the dense fur of a shepherd dog. It's now been two weeks. The rancher is bedridden. he has a high fever. Although his cough has subsided, he's thrown up frequently. His skin has legions and sores. Their animals, their livestock, are clearly ill. A few have died. 
and his wife has notified the County Department of Agriculture, alarmed with what they're seeing. Local representatives arrive, and they bring a commercial veterinarian with them to take notes, photos, and samples. The State Department of Agriculture plans to send a team, but it's going to take them a month before they're there to examine. It's at this point the flood has not yet raised alarms. Their livestock are killed and incinerated out of fear that maybe it's man cow disease or some other contaminant, but by no means would be fit for consumption. I feel it's important to note here that in many zombie movies and in other Halo Flood in the modern day videos, people tend to overestimate the speed at which the world will react. Historically, if you look at the UK when the bovine sponiform encephalopathy, the man cow disease, was first identified, it took a year before they were able to identify that as a novel disease and several to understand both how it spread and the fact that it can infect humans. At this point in the story, the events would not be connected in anyone's eyes. A rancher getting sick with flu-like symptoms in December wouldn't be much of a surprise. A dog growing ill, although sad, would not make the news. Really, I feel like the only thing that might raise eyebrows is the fact that their entire livestock had to be cold. And that's largely because the local community where ranching is important, it's their means of income, people might get worried that it could have spread to their animals, affecting their means of supporting themselves. We now travel to two months. Unbeknownst to the local community, several forms of local wildlife have been exposed. Deer, rabbits, and other animals have been found dead. And while this wouldn't be that abnormal, the spread into local, state, and national forests nearby caught the attention of forestry as well as parks and recreation department personnel, who decided to call over to the state wildlife, fish, and game department and report the random wildlife dying. These departments, the wildlife, fish, and game, and as well as the Department of Health and Agriculture, would have been alerted by now to some sort of abnormal disease affecting animals, but it is not likely that they would be able to connect it to the dog so quickly. It takes too long to connect all these data points, and tracing that first initial case potentially takes years. In a way, in our current world, we suffocate under how much of information is available to us. There's an entire field of study, big data that focus on that, trying to make sense of the millions of data points being collected at any one point in time. Despite all the evidence being readily available, like the dog and the rancher, no one would be able to connect those dots because there's too much noise. How many people went to the veterinarian that day? How many people are getting sick with other flu-like symptoms due to normal diseases? It would be too difficult outside of pure luck that someone would notice. But at this point, two months into the scenario, the rancher has already died. His wife is seriously ill. She's being treated at an ICU unit in the nearby city medical center. Both of them are testing negative for common diseases that may be affecting them. And their lab tests though are showing weird abnormal bacterial growth. They're isolated and medical staff are using protective equipment because it's standard procedure because they don't truly understand what they're up against. They take careful notes and prepare to send that data to county and state officials. It's now been six months. The rancher's wife also tragically died. The flood is too young at this stage. Their exposure and resulting fevers cause their organs to suffer, degrade, and steadily fail. The flood could not take absolute control, so their bodies fought it off as best as it could until ultimately led to their deaths. Several families are also in their same boat, falling ill in the community. Animals are no longer just dying, but acting odd, violent, and attacking each other. Animal control drives down the streets, rounding up animals, examining them, and any sort of signs of infection, killing them. Deer, rabbits, and other wildlife game are being hunted with no limits, including out of season. Their bodies gathered and incinerated. It's at this point that people in the community are starting to notice that a problem is occurring. You might ask why, in my scenario, the flood is so slow. Keep in mind, it took centuries for their initial spread. They're methodical, all the way at a genetic level. They fight intelligently. They know that if they move too quickly, they'll be noticed and contained. If you think back to Halo CE, they killed multiple Covenant and took over, turning their bodies. But they waited, allowing humanity to press deeper into the facility before attacking them. And they tried to repeat the same thing on Master Chief. In a way, they're trying to set up the right conditions to make sure that when they go all out, they succeed. And that is true for this scenario as well. It's now been seven months. USDA authorities have ordered a mass culling of all cattle in the county. Cow bodies are stacked on the side of the road and they're being burnt methodically. Local hospitals as well as veterinarians have taken very clear notes and reporting up numbers to their county and state officials. At a national level, they're starting to notice an increased rate of bacterial infections in Eastern Washington. And they do this through the public health surveillance systems. Lab tests are being collected and they're being sent up and preliminary studies are already being conducted by the CDC. Several in the community have died, but some are showing signs of recovery. 
In their case, the flood is winning. Local animals that were infected are beginning to build biomass around the impact site on the ranch, which in itself lays empty. With the owners being dead, their kids deliberating on selling it, and is with all the drama in the town, why would they visit? And so no one is there to notice the biomass accumulating, slowly taking over all living life there. Local state news is talking about this strange new illness, but really folks outside the town are largely unconcerned. I mean, a dozen or so deaths, bad cattle, bacterial infection, most would just write that off as tragic contamination, maybe a foodborne illness. They wouldn't think too much about it. At the national and state level, health authorities though, they would know something's starting to go terribly wrong. There's many ways that the government conducts public health surveillance. You have things like passive collection, which is paying attention to the reports of new cases of bacterial infections that would highlight themselves. Active surveillance, when the CDC and other health representatives go to the field, they go to that town, and they do things like going door to door asking questions, asking people to fill out questionnaires. Have you been sick? Are you experiencing any symptoms? Have you come into contact with any sick animals? Local hospitals, as well as other public facilities, also ask everyone who enters to self-identify. Some might, but many will lie. And not because they feel like doing wrong by the local officials, but because they're scared. They don't understand what's happening, and they don't understand what might happen to them. And so they want to keep it a secret, in some ways denying it even to themselves that they are sick with the flood infection. Sentinel surveillance is when hospital and lab reports actively reporting the illness are being earmarked. Now known as the novel bacterial infection, it's a discriminant category that they've been able to isolate. They were able to find the flood cells and they're trying their best to study them. Lastly is syndromic surveillance, and that's when you explore symptom rates and you look at that compared to the baseline. It's at this point that the CDC as well as state health officials will be scrambling to understand who's the case number one. And they'll be looking back through the past at all those symptoms. They'd be able to highlight an increased rate of things like skin lesions and vomiting and fevers from a bacterial source. And that higher than baseline level gives them indication for how long it's been occurring. Local media in the community is still scared, but state media is a mix. You have some sensationalism, but some people play down the seriousness of it. In the context of the 2022 and 2023, they're not interested in hearing about all this anymore. And so most really don't understand what's so scary about a rural bacterial infection. It's just bad water, they'll say, wild cattle. It's been eight months now. And it's at this point the CDC and health officials have confirmed with enough statistical data to support that there's an unknown novel bacterial infection outbreak in the town. They spent two months describing it via reports, and they understand loosely the main vector, how it's spreading via bacteria, either airborne or bodily fluids, and they understand that it contains what we know as a flood cells, but to them, is just bacteria. They know it can be highly lethal, and some of the main symptoms is skin growths, legions, sores, bleeding, and then mood changes, particularly violent. Local authorities, out of concern for the outbreak, have ordered residents to avoid moving and gathering in public. Businesses in the small town are shuttered. The town itself is reeling. 1,200 residents, and out of them, 134 have died in the last eight months. Many are sick, and those who are, or even seem to recover, are acting strange. The livelihood of ranching has been decimated. All of their cattle and livestock were cold. Naturally, many of them are terrified and heading back home to stay with family where they feel safer or they can be financially supported, having lost a year's worth of revenue. It is now that the flood is beginning to spread. It's been nine months and the flood outbreak is starting to attract national attention. At first, it was just filler TV, you know, a bacterial outbreak, maybe food contamination. But social media has lit a fire in society. Videos began surfacing of residents randomly and violently assaulting each other. The joke was they're zombies, but clearly they're not. They're still there as people, but it's like something is up with their heads. They're irrational, highly aggravated, and prone to spontaneous bouts of violence. But that zombie comparison, it's catchy, and it spreads like wild. All over Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat, people are talking about the great zombie outbreak in Washington. The CDC is concerned for other reasons, and they notify the National Health Services. The state of Washington has declared an emergency. Cases of the novel infection have already been identified in seven neighboring states, as well as in larger cities, like Seattle to the west and Spokane to the east. You know, when it comes to spreading a disease, there's an art to it. The flood is being methodical, taking it slow, spreading without making it too known. And at this point, it is spread across state lines and into major population centers. It's been 10 months. 2,000 people nationwide have died. 
and a growing number of those who survive and recovered have begun to act abnormal. The zombie internet fame attracted a lot of attention, but it started to turn sour. Influencers flocked to the town of Ground Zero, eager to be part of the action, be part of the memes. And it was all fun and games until one of them was violently assaulted by a resident. His skin was sickly and pale, hair falling out. He had lesions and sores and he hid them under long sleeves. When the police were questioning him, he was shaking and crying profusely, not understanding what compelled him to act violently. He said it was as if somebody was in the back of his head making him do it. The national media though is shocked. It becomes a nightly story. Neighboring states ordered local police to stop all Washington residents from crossing state lines but it's quickly ruled unconstitutional by federal judges. Instead, they have to fecklessly ask that people self-isolate, unable to really enforce it due to laws in the United States. The states are doing what they can. Really, they're just trying to buy time. The original ranch where the meteorite impacted is sickly now. Flood biomass covers two thirds of it, but no one has really picked up. The CDC field team finally discovers the link between the rancher and his dog, both being case number one. They do this by breaking down and tracing backwards how exactly things started to spread. They identified that one of the earliest cases known of the outbreak cluster was the veterinarian that helped treat the dog. And they were able to connect her to the rancher who were they able to prove in a backwards fashion did in fact have the infection based off of the blood samples the hospitals fortunately chose to keep. By identifying that he was one of the first ones and she was very close in after him, they realized they both met each other and connected over a vet visit for a sick dog. A dog that maybe they feared ate something on the ranch but was acting abnormal, showing the signs that they were starting to see in humans as well. That gave the CDC field team a hint and it helped support the national CDC headquarters hypothesis because they were starting to come to a horrifying conclusion. The bacteria doesn't really destroy cells or cause infections intentionally, instead it's trying to replace them. And the reality that many of these survivors might not be surviving after all. The infection they may have may be a long persistent form, causing behavioral and neurocognitive issues. And true to this, several residents at this point have been detained for acting randomly violent, whether it's against their spouses or each other break-ins, violence. At a national level, people write it off. They assume, oh, well, they lost their livestock and their livelihoods. Maybe they're turning to drugs, or maybe they're violent because they're poor. People don't really empathize and connect yet that something is happening under the surface. The people that are sick, they're having these mutations, these sores and lesions, but they're not dying. It's just their cognition and emotional regulation is heavily impacted. They're being medically placed into comas the ones with the most severe cases because they're a danger to themselves as well as others. The hospitals are just trying to buy time to see if they can do anything to intervene to stop the infection, but it's not enough and it continues to spread. At this point, the state has decided to call in the National Guard. The local sheriff only has maybe 12 or so on his staff. And so now the National Guard, a combination of NBC, nuclear, biological, and uh, chemical contaminant trucks, as well as supporting personnel, with a handful of military police are there to augment both to serve in health services forms, but as well as to try and kind of pacify the locals and help get everyone to calm down. A bit of a show of force, showing that the state is there to help. It is such a team that helps the CDC field team go and explore the original ranch. They're covering protective equipment out of precaution. Regulators, full body kits. The National Guard that's with them are there in full mop gear. Their NBC vehicles are completely sealed, as if they were in like a combat location. They do their best to de decontaminate any vehicles as well as public spaces. When they arrive to the ranch, it's disgusting. It's covered in these sickly growths and biomass. They see bodies both of residents as well as local animals congealing together. It's disgusting and horrifying. The field team struggling to make sense of what they're looking at takes photos and samples and decides, hey, it's time to go. And so they get into the van and start to head back into town. The National Guard has been ordered to destroy it. They get bulldozers as well as local trucks and tractors from the community to help them push all the biomass, earth, and the rancher's home even into one big central mound, pile it all up, and then burn it. Unbeknownst to them, both inside the house as well as in the brush around the ranch, several sacks containing viable infection forms. When they're disturbed, as they're being pushed by these trucks, they burst forth. Infection forms pour out. The soldiers are bewildered and they react with fear. A few of them, those who have weapons, open fire as these infection forms scurry across the ground and try to attack. Civilians and other helpers that were there with the tractors 
are startled by the sounds of gunfire and they can see soldiers running across the ranch being chased by things. The sun is setting and confusion rapidly sets in. The NBC platoon leader gets in his truck and he radios back to the hump company headquarters in the police station downtown and he tells them that something really weird is going on. He said local animals inside this weird growth are running all over the place trying to bite us. You can hear gunfire in the background. His company tells him that they need to pack up and do what they can, shoot everything they need to and just burn it. They don't under understand the scope of what is happening. The last communication they get is from the platoon leader to the XO via text message. And he says, Dan, things are getting really, really bad out here. He's like, I don't know what's going on. This is really, really bad. And they don't hear from them again. As the CDC field team is driving away, they can start to hear the gunfire. A sporadic shot here and there, maybe some distant yelling, and then longer and louder exchanges of heavy gunfire. They look at each other with fear. What is happening? At this point in the outbreak, violent civilians have been seen in over 12 cities. Despite being on the news, few are connected. The police arrest them and even kill them as they're spread out over the country acting violently. But on social media, it just looks like a homeless person, sickly, maybe on drugs. People write off the incidents that they would never happen to us. Only the police know that the individual with his hair falling out and covered in sores, he wasn't on meth. He was a programmer who just got back from Washington visiting family. What caused him to pick up a knife and attack people randomly on the street? These small data points are being missed. There's a, a narrative, a story that could be drawn here, but it, it's not able to be seen. We don't have the ability to step back and realize that something is wrong. Autopsies reveal that there's a common connection of an infection, but by the time that data is processed and makes it to the CDC, it's days out of date. Ultimately, it's gonna be too late. The field team makes it back to their hotel, and they get on a video teleconference to report the situation to their national team. They're told that state health officials as well as the governor are gonna join the call. Quickly though, the governor has to step away, silencing his mic. The field team is trying to stress to the national team what's going on. They're concerned and they don't know how to describe it. They're professional scientists, doctors, and they're bewildered. They steadily notice in the background gunfire and it appears to be getting closer. The governor unmutes his mic and he says he was just called by the National Guard Brigade Commander. 23 soldiers are missing. There's violent animals and residents attacking at will. Stories of people breaking into the neighbor's house and violently assaulting them. Many of them are armed. The NBC company that was sent there to support, they're not equipped for war. They're guardsmen and they were there to help on a health mission. They might carry a magazine with rounds, but really they, they're not on a combat posture. I mean, they have military police there with them, but that was, you know, crowd suppression and potentially stuff like that to help the police. They have rounds, but they're not carrying full combat kits. They're not ready for what's about to occur. The local police and the guardsmen quickly decide to collapse down to the headquarters at the station and the parking lot outside. The field team is beginning to get terrified. From what they saw to the increasing sounds of gunfire in the distance, vehicles crashing, they've seen enough. And so has the CDC and orders them to immediately leave. They pack into their van and they get out of there. One of the last few vehicles to make it out alive. The police and soldiers scramble to assess what's happening. The local civilians are breaking into a panic. They're hearing stories and phone calls from their neighbors of being randomly and violently attacked. They gather what they can, including firearms, and they drive into town, knowing that that's where the army and police are. They want answers and they want help. It's night out now and a protest starts to break out. People are confused, they're angry, and they're all consolidating looking for information. Those who can and have the means will gather everything they can and attempt to flee. The platoon of the NBC troops and the MP section that was at the ranch, they haven't been heard back from that text message. Concerned with what's going on, the company commander decides to send a squad of military police out to the ranch one more time. They fully load in two MRAPs. As they approach, they can see homes with shattered windows some even on fire. Vehicles are rolled over, but they don't see survivors. Many of them are getting that feeling, the hair standing up on the back of their neck. Veterans of wars in the Middle East, they should not feel like this in the United States. They opt to combat lock their doors, ready their weapons, and figure out what's going on and get out of there. As they roll up to the ranch, they don't see any signs visibly of people. They see one Humvee rolled into a ditch, its windshield shattered. It's soaked with blood and they can see bullet casings spread around ground, across the ground. They refuse to dismount. They have no reason to get out of their vehicles and many of them are completely unnerved by what they're looking at. No bodies, but no survivors. They use a loudspeaker 
to call out and ask anyone to, to reveal themselves. And they use a spotlight to try and illuminate it. But really, all they see is horrific, vile biomass spreading slowly across the ground like a blight. They call back to the company headquarters. 33 soldiers in the platoon are missing and no obvious signs of survivors, but definitely a struggle. The 29-year-old company commander is under a lot of stress. He's not sure to make what's going on. The civilians that are there protesting quickly start to turn into a riot and spirals out of control. He orders his MP section and then the police join in to use tear gas and bean bags, anything else they have at their disposal to try and control the crowds. But they only brought one MP platoon along with the NBC company, maybe 140 soldiers tops. They don't have the means to control over a thousand very angry and frankly disturbed individuals. Gunfire starts to break out. At first they understand what's going on. It almost sounds like the civilians are shooting each other, but soon they're also being shot at. Hell starts to break loose. Heavy gunfire rings out. Nobody knows what's going on. The civilians are in a clear panic. They're being attacked by the folks next to them who appeared earlier somewhat normal. The power suddenly goes out, a Humvee ramming into a transformer station, exploding in a brilliant flash of sparks. A local journalist and her team that were there are terrified. They watch the chaos ensue in front of them. Cracks of bullets fly past overhead. The soldiers have no idea what's going on, crouching behind their vehicles. It seems like everyone is shooting everyone. They get in their vehicle, in their news van, and they run. They speed as fast as they can. It's hard to see. It's foggy, and the lights are out. As they approach an intersection, a Humvee is there stopped, and they slow down. They comment to themselves, the camera's still alive, like, oh, maybe it's it's the army, they, they can help us, they can get us out of here, maybe they can escort us. But as they approach, they see the soldiers, and they, they seem odd. They're, they're shuffling their feet, they're walking funny. As they step into the glow of their headlights, they see them, they're disfigured, their mop suits torn, their flesh is bulging with growths. The journalist screams as gunshots start to ring out. At the national media station, it cuts their feeds. They stare at each other, the news anchors, in horror and shock. They're not sure what they just saw. At this point, the scale of the issue has grown too much to be ignored. The United States president decides to immediately address the nation. He goes before the cameras. Despite still being localized rural Washington, the high-profile nature of the riots and the extremely alarming reports of dozens, maybe more, police and soldiers being killed has gripped the U.S. with fear. Many might not understand psychologically the U.S. is not accustomed to, not in the last 50 years, losing significant amounts of soldiers in combat. They could never imagine losing two, three dozen in the span of a couple hours in the United States of all places. People are shocked and they want answers, and so the president is there to do his best. On top of that, other nations, allies, and adversaries alike are waking up their leaders. Everyone is starting to become aware that something is happening in the United States it cannot be ignored anymore. The president asks people to stay calm. He doesn't lie. Instead, he tells truths in a way to cause the listener to form a narrative they may not expect. He confidently, yet casually, builds a narrative that it was a riot driven by hysteria and crime. The ranchers, they lost their income. They were frustrated and angry. They believed maybe the county was overzealous with culling their livestock. And then the protests, they got out of hand. Yeah, and a riot broke out, and, and that's that. It, it, there's no links, and the army wasn't prepared for such a civil reaction. They were caught off guard. They, they weren't carrying the, the correct equipment. They are there for a health mission to help with the animal disease, not, not people. And so that's how they frame it. They build confidence by saying the National Guard is deploying, a, with the aid of neighboring states, an entire brigade, over a thousand soldiers to help. A statewide curfew in Washington. They're trying to get on top. They want to control the narrative. They want to get ahead of the news. They try to paint that night's circumstances as a riot that turned violent, with accidents such as the reporter's death being a tragic consequence of soldiers misidentifying a camera for a weapon. The president takes no questions. Him and his team leave. The reporters speculate after, but they have no means of asking if there's a link between the bacterial infection that was kind of in the news but many are still not connecting the dots. But even if asked, the government would try to sidestep and uh, dodge the question. It was a national strategy they decided on immediately prior to the briefing to reduce panic. They understand, based off what they're hearing from the CDC, that if this gets out of control, people will start to freak out. And the last thing they need, particularly with some sort of disease calling, causing violence, is false cases and false alerts and people leading to mass panic. 
Congress is called in at midnight. They're brought into a classified briefing. Members of the National Guard, the Pentagon, intelligence officers are there to brief them what they brief the president. They tell them the truth. Many of the rioters are suffering from a bacterial infection that was thought to be in remission. Instead, it's leading to some sort of neurocognitive psychosis, leading to insanity. They show them photos of the ranch and the sickly growths. One of the congresswomen asks, what's the current status? What's going on in this town? And the intel officer is honest. He says that they hadn't heard from the city in over an hour. The last radio call they heard from the young captain in charge was frantic. The police and army were surrounded, outnumbered 10 to 1, by what seemed like deranged and crazed civilians, many who were armed. Only having 155, including maybe a dozen police officers, they decided to attempt a breakout. The last thing they heard was they were attempting to flee the city with what left they had in vehicles and personnel. Unknown to the Congress folks, in parallel, posts were beginning to appear on social media from soldiers in the company. They show them frantically cowering in the police station, returning fire, but seemingly being surrounded. In the jet black, all you see is fire. Buildings burn and smoke fills the air. Soldiers are terrified. This is more than they ever expected, particularly in the States. They had no idea what they were getting into. One of them cries and says goodbye to his family members. They have no vehicles. The ones they had were burning. They were stuck and outnumbered, and they were going to be overrun. Those that attempt to break out show crazy videos of them flying down the road, smashing through roadblocks, civilians grabbing onto their vehicles, buildings burning, bricks being thrown, and gunshots ringing out. The civilians appear deranged, but still there mentally. They're screaming with both terrifying noises, but speaking, their voices distorted. But between them, small infection forms could be seen scurrying along the ground. One soldier filming in his MRAP shows them their vehicles combat locked. The civilians desperately trying to open the doors while they fly down the road. Suddenly you see an infection form scramble on top of the vehicle. The gunner in the hatch who is shooting at the civilians grabbing their vehicle swats it away, but it latches onto the driver. The soldier drops his phone. You can hear screaming in the background. Gunshots ring out, echoing in the small container of the vehicle, swerving out of control and eventually it rolling over and over and over. Soon the video is silent, playing out in live manner. You can hear the sound of groaning and then blood curling screams, weird biological noises as if creatures were pulling them from their vehicle. Eventually, silence. The president, the governor, Congress, they're all at an impasse. The CDC has enough probable cause that the infection is driving some form of psychosis, but they don't understand enough on how to control it. The footage being spread online is horrifying. It doesn't seem to make sense. Soldiers can be seen grotesquely infected, opening fire on their fellow brothers. More than an infection, something else is clearly present. The people that are seen grabbing onto the MRAPs, trying to tear the doors open, some of them barely resemble humans, with all sorts of weird, grotesque growths on their body. The scientists are doing their best to try to manage the dread, assuring the president and other staff that maybe it's just a highly pathogenic rabies-like infection. But that begs the question, and the president coldly asks, what can we do to stop it? The room is quiet. If everyone ends up like that, how do we stop this? What he's getting at, legally, the president can't deploy federal troops on U.S. soil. And legally, no American citizen can be killed unless it's self-defense without a jury and a trial. How do you approach a situation where civilians, military, and police have been turned by the flood? They pose a significant danger, but killing them is not an option. Now without the entire like civil order of society beginning to collapse, people would lose their minds if they saw the government callously killing people left and right for the sake of managing some sort of disease. The administration station and the state agree. More guardsmen are needed. They're going to contain it. The situation must be controlled. A third of Washington state is ordered to lockdown. Police block roads. Local authorities tell everyone that it's a riot that's gone out of control. They tell them the guardsmen and the army are there to help. No one is allowed outside. Videos on social media show hundreds of MRAPs with soldiers in full kit and mock gear slowly driving down the streets. The lights are out. They're moving very tactically, which leads the, the viewer, the civilians to speculate, if it's a riot, then why is the military carrying heavy machine guns? Why are their helicopters patrolling? Why are all of them moving as if they're going to war? Fairchild Air Force Base, a few hundred miles east in the city of Spokane, also in the lockdown area, has seen enough. They begin to evacuate all of their aircraft further east. Civilians can hear the constant drone of aircraft taking off and it only adds to the uncertainty the unnervedness of what is occurring, people are starting to get scared. 
The next couple days proceed slowly. Hyseria starts to die down. The army's blockade of the original town prevents cameras from getting too close. The president speaks with heads of media companies, leveraging personal relationships as well as, well as political capital to ask them to adjust their messaging to provide wide-scale panic. He wants to downplay what's happening until things are back under control. But despite what is being said, there's a growing sense amongst government, military, and allied leaders that the situation is kindled, awaiting a spark. It's been 11 months. The flood have accumulated enough biomass to begin building a proto grapevine in the basement of the police station. They accumulate the bodies of officers and other military personnel as well as civilians and start to leverage their know-how to build a fighting force. The infected populace, now numbering close to 1,100, have spread out across the county. They travel via vehicle. They do their best to avoid detection. Without the presence of cameras, guardsmen use loudspeakers to advise residents that any sort of what appears to be violent acts may be met immediately with lethal force with no warning. The curfews are lengthened. Several infected vehicles are identified approaching checkpoints. When they refuse to stop, they're fired upon. But the cars, despite taking what should be lethal fire, push through. They burst into fire, crashing into barriers and rolling. Combat forms struggle to pour out and are gunned down. But among them are armored soldiers, some still donning their torn and ripped mop gear. Radio reports of this trickle back to the brigade headquarters. The president, his staff, military, and health authorities grimace. More and more violent encounters are being heard about. They're increasing. Despite the unofficial media blackout, news groups feel they have an obligation to carry stories, showing vehicles blowing past the police and army, bullets ripping past. It is on this fifth night of unrest, an army black hot is brought down by small arms fire. It crashes in a field. Two miles away, a young teenager from a second story window records a video of it and posts it on Reddit. You can see the helicopter trailing fire and smoke, gunfire echoing the distance. It spins and crashes. How are helicopters being shot down in Washington? Reports are getting more dire. The FAA responds with a heavy-handed response. Airspace over half of Washington is closed. All aircraft are ordered to adopt a combat footing. Blacked out, fly at high altitudes, stay out of small arms range. The only assets allowed now are border control drones looking for surveillance. The flood, especially now with the assistance of a proto gravemine, sensing the brigade's efforts to slowly encircle and contain them, devise a plan to break out. It's in the early hours of the ninth night. Dramatic footage shows the grotesque bodies violently attacking checkpoints and convoys. NRAPs captured earlier are used to devastating effect to negate the small arms fire. Horrifying videos make it out on social media showing flood forms breaking through and going home to home in nearby towns. People hiding, locking themselves in their closets. The sounds of grotesque flood forms slowly moving past. The panic starts to reach an untenable level. Mass riots begin to occur in Seattle and Tacoma. Residents are terrified, they're not getting any answers, and there's no solutions. Neighboring states disregard the law. They block all roads out of Washington. If you have a Washington plate, or you're a vehicle approaching across the border, you'll be fired upon. The U.S. is banned globally from traveling to any other nation. Cases of the flood, though, are being discovered all across the world. They're too late to prevent the spread. The president gives a nightly address. He does the unthinkable. He declares martial law and invokes the Insurrection Act for Washington. He asserts that it's still a riot, maybe fueled by a pathogen, but still a normal human interaction. They try to suppress the idea that something else might be occurring. By invoking the Insurrection Act, active duty military forces are allowed to begin moving towards the state of Washington and to take part. The entire state is placed into a 24-hour curfew. Anyone seen outside may be fired upon with lethal force with no warning. It's precaution. The flood are starting to get intensely violent. A third of the state is no longer reachable. Phone lines have been downed, power is cut, casualties are mounting into the hundreds and even thousands. Two thirds of the initial brigade that was sent to contain them are pulled back to an outer perimeter. They've established heavy roadblocks. Engineers have set up concertina wire, HESCO barriers. They're doing everything they can to make a barrier. They have to do something to stop the spread. They're quickly being augmented by active duty forces. But those who survived the initial push out are suffering very visible signs of mental distress. The governor, the president, and the military leadership agrees these guardsmen need to be pulled away from the line of contact. Their combat effectiveness is questionable. Whatever they saw clearly has them incredibly disturbed. The CDC is desperately working with the DOD to, to identify what is happening. They, they understand what they're looking at, but they don't understand how it works. 
nor do they have means of controlling it. Questions begin to circulate if it's a biological weapon attack without being able to conclusively rule it out. The president raises nuclear readiness levels. B-52s sit armed on the alert ramp. They're fueled up and their engines are ready to run. Our adversaries across the planet also begin to arm themselves. Silos are warmed up. Missiles are pre-staged. No one understands what's going on. Everyone can sense the tension. The fundamental problem though, as that original response brigade was retrograding, really running from the flood, their ability to hold a firm line was degraded, and significant amounts of flood have slipped through. Their combat forms target power stations and cell phone towers. They're smart. They're crippling the state of Washington and preventing anyone from understanding what's going on. 10,000 troops surge into the area. Half the state now is locked down. Surveillance aircraft and drones patrol the sky. Innocent bystander casualties spike. Some people are shot for simply being outside their front door. Everyone is trigger happy and terrified. Rumors spread quickly and people see videos that will only be described as pure horror of the flood systematically hunting down anyone behind the line of contact. But despite this happening, there are those out there that doubt the existence of any disease at all, particularly one so outlandish, so alien. They argue it's secretly a hostile government takeover. Some of these groups, they begin to riot violently, striking out at federal forces because they see it a means of government overreach. The flood capitalizes on this discontent and they lash out hard and fast. They target several local guard armories that were left abandoned after the units were destroyed in the initial contact. Using their combined knowledge harvested from the bodies of those already slain, they're able to make use of dozens of Humvees and MRAPs. They seize helicopters, heavy machine guns, and explosives. It's now been 11 and a half months. The day of days arrives. The Flood uses its armament to stage a sweeping offensive to the east and west. They break through the line of contact. Despite all the reinforcements and the barriers, the Flood doesn't care. They don't care about losses. They're able to reanimate those that they lose. The breakout is stunningly successful, and vehicles carrying the Flood quickly make it as far west as Seattle and east of Spokane. Their targets are the International Airport, as well as the bases at Fort Lewis and McCord. Dramatic video shows C-17s attempting to take off from taxiways, basically starting their engines, pointing their nose, and just attempting to flee. Blackhawks can be seen crashing into the ramp. Security forces drive around desperately shooting, but they're not postured. Domestic bases in the United States are not meant for a frontal assault. Crews are unarmed. Infection forms and combat forms sweep into C-17s attempting to take off, quickly overwhelming the crew. Entire aircraft now are starting to be infected by the flood, and they're launching all over the country. Fires burn and rage out of control. The thin fiber that was holding society together in Washington unravels. It collapses. The infection starts to rear its head countrywide, a concentrated effort by the grave mind to instill fear. Despite not being able to turn mass areas nationwide, infected civilians attacking neighbors and lashing out in hospitals, it terrifies the country. There is no amount of control. Riots and violence break out immediately. No one trusts anyone anymore, and neighbor kills neighbor. The CDC, despite their best attempts to, to telegraph and communicate the problems, they're, they're, they're scientists. They don't know how to dumb it down. They're too technical. Civilians are terrified. They're not listening. They can't understand it. It's a disease that cannot be seen. Rumors spread. It's not. It doesn't make you a zombie. Your neighbor will be normal one minute, and then they'll turn on you. They can speak, they have memories. They'll mock you as they attempt to kill you. There's no way to tell who is who. Everyone is terrified. The governor of Washington is forced to flee and the state descends into pure and unfiltered chaos. Those who survive the coming weeks hide. Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane, they burn. The flood roams freely. With the invocation of the insurrection act, the president has significant leeway with his authority and Congress quickly passes the emergency act granting sweeping wartime powers. Civil rights are frozen. The president has full control. The riots in cities are brutally shut down. The administration knows they must regain control of the situation. Nice cities and civility are no longer options. Bombs fall on Washington. For the first time in the United States history, aircraft are bombing its territory, and it's their own, and it's Washington, because it's already too late. The flood are continuing to spread. By the time the authority is given to target ports, airfields, Bridges and roads, significant number of planes have already escaped. Footage can be seen online of airliners crashing on highways, infection forms pouring out, combat forms streaming from the wreckage. The government decides to purge all forms of social media. Internet in the US is effectively shut down. 
Canada, frustrated and angry at the lack of communication with the US, is themselves struggling under what can only be described as deluge of flood into Vancouver. There's no way to secure the borders. Despite the cold temperatures, it's not enough. Losses mount. The US government seeks to establish a new line of control. They make the drastic decision, what was once unthinkable. They need a hard barrier to dig in. Because planes are flown across the country and they didn't get fighters up in time to shoot them down, cities all on the west coast are being overrun. They make the hard decision. The Rockies will be the barrier. They use explosives for rock slides and they collapse the tunnels. The mound passes are blocked. They start to dig in roadblocks, surveillance, drones, and bombers all sweep the area looking. They have filtration sites. Civilians and those fleeing from the west are tested for infection. Those who are good are allowed to evacuate. But anyone who tests positive, unfortunately, is euthanized involuntarily and cremated. Of course, when they hear such shocking things, they fight back, and the soldiers simply shoot them on the spot. You would think that the civilians next to them would be terrified, but they're not. Those who are fleeing from the west have seen the flood spread like wildfire. They simply keep their eyes straight forward and ignore. The horrors continue. The world's watch is shocked. The United States is cannibalizing itself. Casualties at this point are surging past 100,000, and that's because they stopped counting. NATO, utilizing Article 5, starts to pour troops into the United States to assist. The rest of the world ceases all airline traffic and shipping, but it's too late. Flood forms are spreading in China, transmitted by both people coming from the United States, but also through food. Contaminated food delivered months previously across the ocean has made its way to Chinese shores. Citizens, markets are starting to spread the flood and the high population density of the Asian nations is leading it to spread like fire. Worldwide now, the flood is starting to activate. Many of these flood infection forms are able to get enough biomass that they can start to spread freely. China, Russia, other nuclear powers openly discuss nuking the United States as a defensive measure. The president, now residing securely and safely in his bunker in the DC, contemplates the same very action. Conventional munitions are already being dropped across Utah, California, and Arizona. He knows more than anyone else that the end is already approaching. Flood forms have captured significant numbers of aircraft, including fighter aircraft, from bases in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, including top-of-the-line planes like the F-35 and F-16. No, the flood is not just a disease. They're hearing reports of their own friendly bombers being shot down by these aircraft. The flood are fighting back with modern military power. Facing no other choice, he gives the approval, and nukes begin to fall all along the line of contact and over major population areas in the west. Most major cities beyond the line of contact, they're covered in biomass, pouring out spores. But as the nukes fall, the skies grow dark. Winds blowing from the west chill the air. The CDC tells the president worrying news. Temperatures are falling, people are getting sick, it'll be the coldest winter in millennia. Not only that, but spores are being detected all along the line of contact. The flood are attempting to use airborne vectors to spread. It is now the final moments of humanity. Spore infections along these prepared defenses need to break through infections. Anyone improperly equipped or civilians without protection could be turned. This disruption combined with aircraft able to navigate their way into the United States space allows the line of contact to be broken. Flood forms pool on one central location and pour through. Beyond the Rockies is the open heartland of America. No natural barriers, just flat plains. And within 24 hours, even without aircraft, flood are seen as far east as Virginia. The president flees along with much of the government and the military to the United Kingdom. Canada attempts the same. Military leaders quickly realize they're on their own. Air Force, particularly aircraft, realize the entire country is being overrun. They don't have the gas to get to anywhere safe. Videos of F-22s launched out of Virginia crashing off of Iceland, their pilots choosing to eject into the ice and frigid water versus being caught at home and captured by the flood and turned. What's left of the military attempts to board boats and planes any ticket out, but many of them are left behind and they hold out in desperate last measures like the Alamo, attempting to prevent the inevitable, but ultimately the flood wins. Each of them is killed. Each of them is turned. The entirety of the United States is contested. Those who attempt to hold out are buying time, but it's not enough. Canada, Mexico quickly follow. Nuclear strikes pepper the United States, but they're ineffective. Even the largest nukes only have thermal effects up to 15 or 20 miles. 
Sure, that burns the flood, but they'll be replaced. Hundreds of millions now have been converted. There simply are not enough nukes to cover the entirety of the United States. The flood knows it. The flood is like a liquid. They never concentrate. They move freely. They flow past obstacles. The nukes do no good because they spread themselves everywhere all at once. It's now been 15 months. There's a lull in the fighting, or at least that's how it appears. What's left of the US military and government, they dig in along with their NATO allies in Western Europe and they prepare for the worst. Distrust begins to run deep. Nations turn on each other out of a savage and existential means of survival. The UN was dissolved when New York City fell. None of the major powers are cooperating. They keep secrets from each other. Almost all of North America has been overrun. Latin and South America beg for help, but everyone simply ignores their calls. No one is going to go. The flood slowly pours south, and soon the entirety of the Americas is quiet. But what they don't know is flood-controlled aircraft have been crossing the Bering Strait from Alaska for months. The Russian government has banned all communication. Same with China. They would never willingly tell their NATO adversaries what was going on, and by the time it was noticeable, it was too late. Central Asian states like Kazakhstan and Mongolia are the first to speak publicly about signs of mass flood spreading throughout the Eurasian region. Nuclear weapon stocks are almost entirely depleted. Fuel is limited. Civil society is largely collapsing. Everyone is desperate for a search for a way to escape, but there's nothing. There's no means of hiding. Flood hordes pour west of the Urals and across the Tibetan Plateau. There aren't enough forces to stop them. At this point, there's more flood than humans. Anyone who's left, they hide. It is truly Armageddon now. Cults arise. Religious fanatics seek to explain and escape through their ideology, but there is no answer. There is only one path, and that is assimilation into the flood. It's now been 24 months. Earth has been defeated. The surface is discolored with biomass. Spore towers fill cities, and the hazy fog of the flood covers the surface. What few survivors are left are hiding on limited time. The flood is methodical. It is inevitable. It will find all of them and hunt them down. Even in their last moments hiding, the flood is already gathering material. They're building ships to take them from Earth to other planets to continue the conquest. The flood are victorious. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this fictional narrative. The flood has always been terrifying to me, and this was largely inspired by nightmares I actually had as a kid from playing too much Halo CE one night. I know many out there have made videos on this, but I feel like they overestimate how quickly it would occur, how much nations would work together, and how the lack of real world societal collapse, like the likelihood of that occurring. You know, based off what we've seen in the last few years, I think we can all understand now that it truly would be brutal, and humanity would not band together like we would imagine. It would be the end for all of us. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. More episodes next week. Take care. Have a great weekend.